In this video, we're going to go over a lot of the features and functions of Laser Gribble. First thing we're going to go through is the menus up here. Okay. And inside these menus, there's a lot of sub menus. So, first thing, let's take a look at our interface here. We have this connect button right here, right? So, once I get my COM port selected and the baud rate selected, I can hit this button. Well, I can also hit it inside here. So I'm going to do that right now. Okay, it's connected. It's in an alarm state. Mine starts up in an alarm because it needs a homing cycle. So I've got a few of these buttons now open. The reset, the homing cycle, and the unlock. Okay, yours might not have a homing cycle. Most of the lower cost eBay, Amazon, uh, Banggood, AliExpress machines don't have a homing cycle. Like you can add a homing cycle, but they don't come with it. So if I, so let's, let's look at this again, reset, homing, unlock. So I go into this menu, reset, homing, unlock. So these three are available here also, okay? Currently, my machine is locked, okay? So that means that it needs a homing cycle or an unlock command sent to it for it to start talking. So if I were to go to Gribble Configuration, what this does is it reads all the settings inside my controller. This is great for the first time you connect to your machine. Make sure it's unlocked. Make sure your status is idle. But if it's not idle, it's going to do this, okay? Okay. Showing cached values. So this is the last time it read it. It's showing this. It can read and write only when connected and idle. Right now it's connected. Right? It's connected. But it's not idle right now. It's currently in an alarm state. So let's try this one more time. I'm going to unlock it now. I'm going to hit unlock. It says message, caution, caution unlocked. And the status is idle. So go back to Gerbil here and go back to the configuration. Now it says it read it successfully. There's no warning message down here. So what it read is my x-axis maximum travel, my y-axis maximum travel. Well, it read everything, but these are the important things it pulled out. My maximum spindle speed, my homing cycle. Okay. If I have a homing cycle, if there's a 1 there and not a 0, it's going to add this button down here. That way you can home your machine. Okay. So when you first connect your machine, it's best to unlock it and go to Gerbil Configuration. That way you can read it. It also now knows that my maximum speed right here was 12,000. I'm going to skip over settings right now. I'll get back to that in a little bit. That's a big one. Materials database. This is kind of a cool feature where you can choose your engraving settings using specific lasers. And so these are popular lasers that are out there. The Ortours. I have a 20 watt Ortour. I also have a 3.5 watt Ortour. I have some 500 milliwatt UVs. So if I, were to, if I were to engrave these things, it would come out pretty accurate, probably. <laughs> it depends. Like, okay, so this is set for walnut, right? Walnut comes in such a variety of shades. So Peely's is pretty, pretty even. Poplar's a tough one. Like, Poplar's just white, and it's hard to engrave. So the fact that it has settings for that is really cool. Birch. Birch is boring, but it's a popular one to cut. It's very good for cutting. Anyways, so it's cool that it has these settings. I can show you how to load these in your cut a little later. Probably in another video, I'll show you how to use these. But it's really cool that it has these settings built in. Okay. So that's how to check out your database. We're going to get back to settings later. Right now, we're going to go to the file. Okay. So under here... This is how I open files. I can also hit this check mark right here, 
right? If I hit this check mark, it's the same thing. Hit cancel, go to file open. I'm going to open up, sure, the little plaque that's currently on the moon right now. Okay. And I can do all my settings, hit next. Now I can go to my material database and choose one if I wanted. Anyways, do all my settings, bring it in here. Okay. So I brought it in. Wait, I need to change my settings. Well, that's easy because I can go file, reload the last file. Okay. And now instead of me having to navigate to that file again, it just brings that file right back up. And now I can say, well, I actually wanted to do it vertical engraving. Hit next and hit create. And now instead of going left and right, it's going to go up and down. Okay. Well, I actually have a few things I want to do on here. So I know this is 29.4 millimeters wide, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go file, append file. So what this does is it adds another file on top of this. So I want, sure, I'll do bewitched right next to it. Also do it vertical. Okay. I'll do it. I'll leave all those settings the same. And I'll leave all that the same. Sure. Oh, except for my offset. So what I'm going to have this is 40 millimeters to the right. So now when I create this, the start of this is going to be at 40 millimeters to the right. So you can see where it starts there at 40 millimeters. So that's what a pen file does. So I can open a file. I can also add things on top of it. So now I can do multiple pictures on the same thing and then take it to my table saw and cut them out. That might be nice for like leaving it for 10 hours to engrave. I'm going to do something, coming back, cutting out all your pieces. Anyways, I can also save. So I don't need to use laser gerbil to stream my data. I can use a lot of controllers just to stream my data, but I can save this uh, G code if I want. I'm not gonna save that right now. And then there's some advanced options where even though you just opened it, maybe you want to, you do multiple passes typically. Well, you can also do that in here. So that way it'll, it'll double the amount of G code in there, basically. <laughs> Okay, you can also, when you're saving it, you can save the header and footer. And I'll go over that in just a little bit. Okay. So, once I got my program set up, I can either hit play here, or I can go file, send to the machine. Okay. Now, if my machine messed up for some reason, and I know exactly where it messed up, I can continue it from that line. So I can go to file, send from position, and whichever G code line. So right now, if you look in the lower left here, there are 72,318 lines to this program. If I know that it messed up on line, let's say 30,000, I can type in 30,000 and have the machine start from that point. Uh, I rarely use it. If I mess up, I just grab a whole new sheet of wood because I've rarely had success. I guess if I've used this on milling machines, I've done that before. Anyway, so that's file. Colors. This is one of the things I requested years ago. So what happened is I had a class here where this was the default look of it. Now, everybody built their laser. And then, okay, everybody put on glasses and let's load up a file. So they loaded up a file and they said, hey, I can't see it. And that's because they were all wearing red glasses. When you wear red glasses, you can't really see red lines. It just looks blank in here. So I asked the creator if he could add this. And about four days later, he released a new version with four of these. I don't remember which four, but I do know he added red laser on top of it. So now it's blue. So with your red glasses to protect from the blue light, you can easily see these colors. So I was very grateful for that.
That's what this menu does. It just changes the color interface. <laughs> okay, anyways, back to back to this one. <laughs> languages. I guess it's popular. When I started using this, there were five languages. And then he just kept adding and adding. People kept requesting them, and then another person would, like, translate it for him. So, I guess it's in a lot of languages. It's kind of cool. And this is one of the cool features. I used to have to, you know, open up Arduino to flash everybody's firmware. But now, it's right here. So, what I can do is... Oh, yeah, it also has a C8340. If you're using an Arduino Nano, chances are it has a CH340 chip that converts... Well, that that converts USB into serial. So you, most of your machines are connected through USB connection. What the CH340 chip does is turns that USB connection into a serial connection. And the CH340 takes special drivers. Now, some of these controllers use a, use a uh, Atmega 16U4 or 16U2. So that one you don't need special drivers for, like the Arduino uh, Unos. The Unos, the Megas, a lot of boards use uh, the 16U2 chip, which don't need drivers. A lot of the cheaper Chinese boards use the CH340 chip, which takes a special driver. They're also not quite as reliable as a 16U2. So if you have like data issues, transfer issues, if you're crashing randomly, you might want to might want to point the blame at this CH340 chip. Anyways, what I'm going to do, let's see, I got to disconnect first. And now under my tools, I can actually load up uh firmware to my machine if I wanted. So it used to be I had to open up Arduino I go in, I turn it to two axis homing, and I'd select Uno or Nano. It's typically an Uno with a shield. And then I'd have to wait for it to compile and upload. Well, in here, it's uh it's already set up for you. Now I'm not a fan of their XY homing because it does a double homing, which is annoying and I'm not very patient, but it makes sense that it does it. So I can give it three-axis firmware or two-axis firmware. Most of your lasers are two-axis firmware. What happens with the three-axis is the first thing it tries to home is your Z-axis. Now, if you do not have a Z-axis, it's just going to sit there and hang, and then it'll show an error. Eventually, it'll fail, it'll become locked, and you won't be able to use your machine. With two-axis, now it knows there's no Z-axis, and so it'll... Just home your X and Y axis, and you'll be good to go. You can also add custom firmware. I've never done that. And then, you know, the com you're on, the baud rate to program it, etc. Okay. Cancel that. Now let's get a little deeper here. Gerbil settings. Lots of different settings in here. First thing that I do when I install a new set is I'm not... I'm not a fan of sounds coming from this stuff. So I go to my sound settings and turn them all off, right? I understand why they're there. If I was doing, like, manufacturing, I probably want an error sound <laughs> or, like, a warning sound, maybe even a success sound so I know to, like, turn around and look and put on the next piece. But for the most part, I don't like the sounds on, so I'll turn them all off. They're on, they're off. They're just these little check mark boxes. Okay. So that's one of the newest features. Protocol. So most of your boards speak Gerbil. Okay. I know this speaks Gerbil because it told me it speaks Gerbil. Well, it's interesting because Smoothie can also speak Gerbil. But chances are you know you have a Smoothie board. Most, uh, most machines don't come with a Smoothie board. A Smoothie is an upgrade board. And it's usually used for 3D printers. But it can run the, the separate motors very fast on them. So you can get a much faster prints. 
which means it's great for lasers too, because if it can move the head fast, now you can skip all that white space with lasers. Marlin is a uh, 3D printer firmware. So it sends a little bit different commands to get the thing moving and talking. And it also, uh, there's jog commands in regular Gerbil. There aren't just plain jog commands in Marlin. So it's got to send a little bit different information if you're using a different board. But chances are you're using a Gerbil board. USB serial. So it's interesting that it calls it USB serial because you can connect to it through a COM port also. Like if you just have an old COM port with a very old Uno, you can use that too. Okay. If you're connected to your machine through Bluetooth, it's going to show up as a COM port and you're still going to use USB serial, even though you're not connected through USB. Telnet's an interesting one. So it's slow, but chances are you don't need much speed for this. It's not actually sending that much data that often. I've used it before on ESP32 boards, and I've had some success, <laughs> but I prefer to be hardwired. I prefer a USB cable on mine. LaserWeb, so Telnet is over Ethernet. LaserWeb is also over your Ethernet, over your network. Okay. It's not necessary in ESP8266. I know. It was designed for the ESP8266, but now it's on many different boards, LaserWeb is. So again, that's another thing that takes a different protocol, uh, ascending protocol. And then emulator. Emulator, so if I just want it to think it's connected and try some features out, I can use emulator. So it's going to trick the machine or trick the software into, think there's a, into thinking there's a machine connected. Interesting. <laughs> I've used it just to check it out, but that's just a wand of the software, I guess. I'm going to put it back to USB serial because that's what I usually use. Streaming mode. So if you're having lots of errors, if you have a weird board, a weird setup, uh, well, we'll, we'll keep buffered on there. But uh, if I do synchronous, that's what I had to do when I was using Telnet as I had to do synchronous. So that means it sends one command. It tells it to move somewhere. And once that's executed, it'll put a green check mark that it's executed, and then it'll, it will send the next command. It doesn't actually use the internal buffer. So it sends one command at a time, waits for it to complete, then sends the next command. It's a very slow process. Buffered keeps track of the internal buffer of the Arduino. So it tries to keep a lot of commands in there. So instead of having to slow down at the last command and wait to see what's coming up next, it can see, oh, you're actually still going the same direction. I don't need to slow down. I can just turn the laser on and off and keep going. So it can go a lot faster. And then if it detects an error, it resends the last command. I've never used this one, but it's interesting that it has it. Okay, keep it on buffered because that's what they typically use. This is how fast it sends the data and how often it receives the data back. So let's uh, right here. It tells me where it thinks the machine, the head is at, what the feed rate is, what the spindle speed is. It also has this little cursor down here. I can speed up that data, speed up those inquiries by going ultra fast and saying it's <laughs> right. So I don't necessarily need it, but it's might be interesting to see. Uh, issue detector. They added that a good while ago. Uh, if it thinks that it should have completed something and it never did, it's going to think that the board timed out or something's wrong. Uh, and it'll show you an error. Kind of cool. It's better than just sitting and staring at a screen doing nothing. It, think, it figures out there's an issue. Okay. Soft reset. Uh, once you hook up Laser Gerbil, once you hit this connect button, first thing it does is send a reset. Not always necessary, but 
it's a nice it's nice to start at zero, right? It's nice to start with a blank canvas. So it makes sense here. A hard reset. So that dumps all the data. Dumps all dumps everything that it knew. So if if I had my homing cycle enabled and I homed it, and if I have hard reset enabled, as soon as I connect to my machine, it's gonna lose homing. And so I'm gonna have to rehome it. It uh that's what I typically use. <laughs> I guess I don't really have a reason like not to use it. So I just leave it enabled. Okay, next thing we're going to look at. Raster import. So support PWM. Uh, the older versions of Gerbil do not support laser dimming. Like the laser is either on or off. You can't dim it. The latest versions of Gerbil support laser dimming. So that way I can go line to line and actually do grayscale. So when the laser's like half power, it leaves it, it leaves a half dark line, right? It leaves a gray line. When it's all the way on, it leaves a darker black line. So PWM is cool. Uh, I don't know why you turn that off. Unidirectional engraving. So if your machine is just, I don't know how to say this nicely, but like beat up, not well constructed. Uh, like it's just, it's not in good operating condition. You might want to choose unidirectional engraving because this will make sure that everything is a little more even. It'll, it'll only engrave in one direction. So typically when I'm engraving an image, it starts on the left side, moves to the right, goes up a little. And then it starts on the right side, moves to the left, and goes up a little. So left, right, up, right, left, up. Unidirectional, that means it goes from the left side to the right side. And then it jumps over and up, back to the left side, and then starts engraving to the right. So a uh, lot slower. But if your head's loose, if anything's loose on your machine, it's going to clean it right up. It's a great way to see if your machine's loose too, because if you can't get good like quality engravings and then you get them with unidirectional, there's something that needs to be tightened on your machine. Okay. High res filling. So I don't go over 12 lines per millimeter. Uh, it can take up a lot of memory. I mean, even this little, you know, it's a, Here's 30 millimeters high by 70 millimeters wide. This program here is already 72,000 lines of code. Okay. I've, uh, I've done two foot by four foot engravings before, and that takes about 20 minutes to actually turn into code. If I were to enable high res filling, so right now this is 10 lines per millimeter. If it was 20 lines per millimeter, this would quadruple because not only is it double the amount of data up and down? It's double the amount of data left and right. So this would be what? 72, 144, uh, 288, <laughs> 288,000 lines instead of 72,000. So a lot more data. And then if you go above 20 lines per millimeter, that's even more. So it's going to take up a lot more memory. And I haven't seen a practical use for this. Okay. So one of the one of my favorite things, I've used Lightburn a lot. I prefer laser gerbil for images because of the way it uses G0. G0 means move to a certain point as fast as you can. Okay, so let's look at look at this image here. So as it's engraving the bottom of this, it's just going to go back and forth with that laser on. Okay, it's going to keep going. Let's say it's done with this signature down here. Well, it's, now it's engraving this point, and then it's got all this white space to skip. And now it's going to engrave this point. Well, it can go, you know, like the same speed as a laser, right? Let's say it's at 2,000. It can, you know, just go steady 2,000 across, and it's going to take quite a while to do that. 
or we can use G0 fast skip, which means it's going to move from this point right here to this point as fast as it can and then start it lasering again. And then it's going to come up here, laser a little, and then jump as fast as it can again over to this point. So I like G0. Some machines might have problems uh, with skipping. Like your image might be skewed, might get waves in your image. If you're having that, you might want to disable G0. So it's going to go slower, but at least it's going to turn out correctly. And then you're going to want to think about upgrading your stepper motor driver or your stepper motor. Or slowing down your rapid speed. Okay. Next thing we'll look at is jog control. So continuous jog. Uh, I can just hold this button and it's just going to keep moving. Instead of, you know, picking my increment in speed, I just hold this and it's just going to keep moving to the right or left or up or down. I prefer just to move it by increment. I guess I'm used to it like that. And then show Z up and down control. That's really cool because when I connect my little 3018 and 4018 mils to this, I can now, you know, bring the spindle up and down. So that's that's a nice feature that they added. If I were to uncheck this and hit OK or save, this little Z down here will go away. But I'm going to keep mine because I like it. Automatic cooling. That was another feature I requested. So I teach these classes, and I order a ton of lasers for these classes so people can build their own CNC lasers. Uh, what happened with one batch of lasers, I was like, hey, these are burning out. What's happening? And they said, oh, uh, it can only be on for 10 minutes, and then it has to cool down for 20. I was like, so I got to sit there and wait at my machine to turn this thing on and off and pause it? Like, that's lame. And so this was another feature request I made. And this was about two weeks later or so, uh, the developer released this auto cooling feature where now I turn this on. I say that laser's on for, I don't know, 10 minutes. And it's off for 10, I guess. Sure. I think that was what it was. I think you can run it for 20 and then let it cool for 10. I think that's what it was. But it now has that feature, so I can just run it, and then it'll say set it's cooling while it's, you know, while the diode's cooling. I wish they would just have told me that at first, like put it on their ad, but whatever. I wouldn't have bought it if it needed cooling. But now that I have this, I can still use those lasers. Anyways, turning this off. G-code. Here we have headers and the multi-pass and the footers. So some people do this thing where they have their laser head on a Z-axis. And if they want to go deeper, they actually move the laser head deeper. Kind of weird. It doesn't quite make sense when you look at the shape of a cone. But some people like to do that. So you can every time it does a multiple pass, it can bring the Z down a little bit. So this is increment mode instead of, you know, absolute mode. Brings the Z down, puts it back in absolute mode. Okay, absolute coordinates, I guess. <laughs> instead of incremental coordinates. I will explain that in another video, what the difference is. And then once it's done, you can have it go back to the zero point. You can also have it do things like M9, that turns the coolant off. If you have like an air cool, so my header might turn the coolant on, right? So I can use an M8, and now my coolant's on. Maybe it's an air, air assist to get rid of the debris. Maybe it's water for my milling machine, but the M8 turns it on, M9 turns it off. Okay, I'm going to get rid of those. I don't want to save that on there. And then again, we're back to sound settings. So those are all the features and functions in here. I guess there's this, the last little one, help. 
So you can check out your session log. If you're having a lot of issues and you're going to you're going to report the issue, you might want to open a session log, run the thing and uh yeah, just send this send this whole thing to the developer and they can uh they can check this out. Online help, a little deeper extension log, open up the Facebook page where everybody talks about this stuff, donate. Uh, if you use this software a lot and are making money off it, <laughs> I really do like hope you give back a little bit at least because it is free. Like The guy doesn't make money. It's just one guy. He's over in Italy. He does this uh in his free time but he uh he supports it very well like i'm really happy with it and he constantly adds features and functions and fixes things so definitely if you have the means donate if you don't have the means don't even worry about it and then there's auto update every time it uh boots up it'll tell me if there's new uh, if there's a new version, I usually ignore it. <laughs> I don't I don't do minor changes. I don't do pre-release. Sometimes I'll wander the website and look at the pre-release and see what features they add. Anyways, okay. So that's everything. So we went over all these these pieces here. The open file, all this stuff that's already out here, right? What the colors do, why they're there. Languages are pretty obvious, straightforward. The tools, how to use them and when to use them. And the help stuff. Anyways, I hope this video helped you understand what this software is capable of doing. Thanks for watching.